Hello, everyone. Welcome to How to Serve on a Nonprofit Board. Uh, I'm Sarah Dixon. I'm the Adult Programming Manager here at the Advanced Sorry, I do need the microphone because we are going to, we're recording this session so that we can post it later on our YouTube channel. But what I was saying is that uh, I work here at the Advanced Learning Library and we have a whole um, civic series planned for this year. And so uh, coming up next month, we're going to do a program on voter ID laws. Um, then in April, we're going to do uh, how to run an election in Sedgwick County. And we're going to have the election office here and uh, walk people through all of that. And then in May, we're going to have our friends at the city come out and do a an abridged version of of their Civic Engagement Academy, which is normally like an eight-week thing. They're going to condense it down into 90 minutes. So uh, that should be really good. I know. <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit of a teaser. So um, yes, we're just, we're really excited about getting people involved in their community. Um, it is an election year, and so it's a great reminder to just get involved and be um in your community and whatever ways work for you, right? So today, if that choice for you is to serve on a nonprofit board, we have Laura Roddy here who um, works at Exploration Place, but also with the Junior League and runs a training for people to be on boards. Um, so we're really excited to have her. I'm going to just read you her bio. Um, Laura is the chief of this club. Yeah. <laughs> I hope mine works, but this I hope the important one is it working? Oh, yeah. You know, why don't you okay, yourself? I'll introduce myself. Yeah. That's perfect. Okay, Thanks. so hi, welcome everybody. Um, so my name is Laura Roddy. Um, I'm the vice president for advancement at Exploration Place. So I work, which is a nonprofit, and I pre previously worked at Mark Arts, another uh, nonprofit. So I work at nonprofits as a staff member. Um, but then I've also served as a volunteer on various local boards, and one of my involvements has been through the Junior League of Wichita, so I have been on that board several years and was um, the president for a couple of years. So through Junior League of Wichita, I am part of um, a team of us who have gone through training uh, by an organization called Board Source as consultants, and Board Source is just an excellent resource if you do find yourselves, if you're inspired after this or want to continue board service. They have just excellent resources. And so a lot of what I'm sharing with you today has come um, through our board source training. So before we talk about serving on the board, I guess we should just talk about nonprofits in general. So nonprofits are awesome. Um, there is whatever you might care about. There is probably um, a nonprofit connected to it, a mission that you can get involved with. Um, you don't always have to join a, a board I and mean, you can get involved by just volunteering. You can serve on committees, but something that um, is common to all nonprofits is that they're, they are all governed by a board of directors. And so part of that is because nonprofits kind of exist as a special um, tax status, I guess, in our society um, in that any, they, all, they have to have a mission and any, some nonprofits can be quite large and they can, in a, as a way as a nonprofit business, they can be a pretty large business. But what distinguishes them is that any proceeds are reinvested back into that mission of whatever the nonprofit has goal or they're trying to accomplish in society or problem they're trying to solve. So because of that, we want to put, um, it's very important that we kind of have a little more scrutiny on them, that we want to have transparency. And so uh, nonprofits are, governed by a board of directors, um, volunteers, uh, in pretty much every instance that I can think of, which is a little different from like corporate boards and things. And so um, what we'll talk about now is if you get involved, what, what the board's roles are and what an individual's responsibilities are for in serving on that board, because you kind of are signing up to just, um, there's a mission and then you're going to be trying to um, I guess, extra scrutiny for that public trust. So we want to make sure that um, things are 
uh, handled well. And again, there's no ultimate owner. So the board of directors governs it, but there's no one that owns that nonprofit. So let's get started a little bit. If I've got the, oh, went the wrong way. Okay. So um, the key roles of a board, there's three, I kind of like this little umbrella graphic from, um, from board source, and there's three main roles of a board, and then they relate to the um, board source has kind of identified. Identity. So you've got to make sure that there's a mission and there's a purpose and then you advocate for them. So like I know um, the mission of Exploration Place is to inspire a deeper interest in science and technology through creative and fun experiences for all. You know, you've got to know you have that focus and that mission is kind of your parameters of what you design your programs around. So you determine your mission and purposes and you advocate for them. And you also need to ensure effective planning. Uh, another major role of the board is to ensure that there are resources. So that means selecting the chief executive if there are if there is one, because there are some nonprofits that have no employees. And as the board member, in some ways, you're kind of really a working board and not just governing or advising. Um, and they can be quite large and there can be many, many zeros uh, in that bank account. So the board, to ensure there's resources for this, whatever mission you want to accomplish, um, you've got to select the chief executive, um, build a competent board. And so a lot of times um, boards will, um, within them, they'll have a, a nominating function where they're trying to, where you're figuring out who to recruit new, new board members on. And sometimes we'll do skill matrices where we'll identify where could um, we use more help. Like, you know, if you have any, um, expertise in if you've got some law, some IT, some human resources. Oh, the board, any, any nonprofit will be like, please, they'll just be raising their hands. They'll want any expertise, but also just a passion and a care for the mission. So you don't have to have some kind of super specialized skill, but if you do have one, they're just going to be like rolling out the red carpet saying, please help us. Um, so you want it, um, as part of that, under that umbrella, we call ensuring resources where you want to help enhance the um, organization's public standing. So you are there sort of to be an ambassador and an advocate and then ensuring adequate financial resources. So part of that is just understanding what, what revenue streams might already exist for this nonprofit and what potentially there could be. And then what program expenses they need, what, what you need to run the programs that you have or what you might desire. And so um, in some cases, there's, um, so nonprofits may have, they may collect fees for services. So they may provide some kind of service and they may have income coming in through that. But then oftentimes there's also the fundraising side of things. And this could be, um, it could be governmental grants to execute um, that program or that mission. It could be seeking supports from private foundations, individual givers, um, and so oftentimes um, the board is looking at that and you're, and you're kind of, you might partner with the staff to actually do it, but you want an overall plan of what are those main revenue streams coming in. And lots of times you want to try to diversify or balance it if you can, because if, you know, 90% of your income is from a particular government grant and that dries up, then all of a sudden you have to regroup. Um, and that's why the budgeting process is important, but I think something else to always know is that budget is your guide for the year. And so as a board, you need to keep checking in and kind of, you need updates on how things are going and you kind of need to um, um, estimate, estimate what's happening and maybe make decisions. So it's okay if, th if things aren't going to plan, if there's a real shortfall in revenue, then you maybe need to make some decisions on your expense side, but it's just kind of a plan and you want to keep going on that. So ensuring adequate financial resources. So uh, one of the best things board members can do sometimes is almost is um, help connect your networks and make introductions and uh, make connections that way. So then the third thing about uh, the third major role of the board is to provide oversight. So um, supporting and evaluating that chief executive and kind of giving an annual review, um, protecting the assets and providing that financial oversight 
So if you are on a board, I, you know, you do need to every month that, or let's say the board, sometimes the board might only meet quarterly, but you do want to have financials presented to you and you do want to review them. And you should, you do want to understand where the major revenues coming in, where the expenses, and if there is a um, major change or discrepancy from what was anticipated, then you have to be able to um, adjust and, re and make a new plan. And then you should, in oversight, you need to provide, ensure legal and ethical integrity and monitor and strengthen programs and services. Then, let me see if I've got my next one for you all. Um, so you do actually have individual responsibilities uh, when you agree to serve on a nonprofit board. And most um, nonprofits will actually usually um, carry a little bit of insurance to insure, <laughs> insure you as a um, member of that board. So we've got three things, a duty of care, a duty of loyalty, and a duty of, of obedience. The duty of care means when you sign up to be a board member, so, you know, you may, sometimes you may be volunteering somewhere. You may just enjoy working with that program service. But when you step into the board, you are taking on a new role of, of helping kind of ensure that public trust that's been granted to that status of the organization. So care means just paying attention to the organization's core activities and operations. Loyalty means you should put the interests of the organization before your personal and professional interests. It is very common. We, I hope if you join a board that they may ask you to sign an ethics statement or disclose any conflicts. So just so in case something comes up with your business, with a business interest that you have or your spouse might have, you may recuse, recuse yourself from that discussion or, if, you know, your business would be some sort of client to your nonprofit. So that's typical that you might just have a disclosure of what things you might have a conflict of interest in. Uh, and then the last one is obedience. And that is actually your duty of obedience is to just comply with federal, state, local laws um, and your organization's bylaws. So all nonprofit organizations should have, I mean, they're often not super um, voluminous or anything, but there should be sort of a basic bylaws. Um, one of the things that is important in, in boards and sometimes or in nonprofits Sometimes they start out small and there's a founder and there's a passionate founder and they've got their team in, but it really is important for a healthy organization and a healthy board to have terms and to have people rotate on and rotate off and get new people in. You know, um, for example, a couple of nonprofits that I've worked at, it's usually three-year terms. Um, and, and a lot of times it's after you, they limit you to two, three year terms, and then you need to at least take a year off. And then maybe you can come back if you're so passionate about it. And I do think that is important because sometimes you can go down kind of a tunnel vision path and, um, it's, it's, it is important. And, it, and, you know, for new ideas, you need to have new people coming in, people rotating off. And also if you do care so much about this nonprofit and you want it to continue, then I think, you know, just like you always need new volunteers coming in, new donors, you, you need new board members coming in. Cause eventually if you just keep with the same dozen folks, uh, eventually at some point, you know, they're, they're gonna, you're gonna cross the rainbow bridge or whatever that is. Um, and I should say, I'm going to go through, I don't have a ton of slides. I'm going to go through an overall, there's like eight or nine of them. And then I'll take a little time if you have any questions. Um, and if you have any along the way, feel free to interject or raise your hand. So the next thing, um, oh, I actually do want to, this isn't on my screen, but um, board source also surveys um, members of boards. And one thing I thought was interesting, they ask, have asked people serving on boards to rate themselves as a board, like how is our board doing? Typically, boards are rating themselves really great on mission, like, yes, we know our mission, we understand our mission, we care about it. Okay, so that's awesome. They generally give themselves B ratings and saying, yep, we got it. We're doing the financial oversight thing. We're, we're on board with legal and ethical guidelines. We're supporting our CEO. We are being having strategy. Um, something that's a big deal, I think, I think for a board is if you want to think of your role, if there is staff, the staff is executing the program, the day-to-day, -day, the annual. The board should be future focus, forward, so having a strategic plan, knowing where you want to go, thinking strategically ahead, and then also monitoring that, that financial oversight. So I think those are the two, two biggest things about being on a board. 
So people say, oh, we're doing good at strategy. We're doing okay at evaluating our CEO and we're monitoring our performance. Where they give the boards give themselves the lowest rela- um, grades are in community relations, fundraising, and board composition. So I think that if that's something to remember, and if you think those things don't scare you or you think you have something to offer, believe me, boards are be happy to have someone that just wants to help relate to the community. Yes. Community relations, board composition, and fundraising. So they, if you are wanting to just help, um, something else that's kind of neat is, um, or I think about, uh, um, well, I lost my track on, the, on that, but I would say that um, you'll find typically when you're serving on a board, um, the most important thing is that you, I think that you connect with that mission and you have a passion for it. Sometimes um, it depends. People get worried like, well, do I have to do a lot of fundraising? Sometimes, yeah, they will love you if you want to fundraise. But the other things you can do is just help make connections, be an ambassador. And then typically, I think what I think is kind of a prevailing trend in nonprofits is that people will say, hey, if we're if you're serving on our board, we would love for you to just um, – make any any gift that might be meaningful uh, to you or that, that you would consider us one of your top three or four most important charities. They just want to know that you're, you're kind of invested in it. Uh, another thing that's important, depending on the type of nonprofit, because we ha- we're across everything. You've got arts, you've got culture, you've got um, basic services and needs, you've got animals, you know, there's nonprofit for everything. Um, sometimes another thing, thing that boards are looking for is they're looking for, um, if they serve, there's a client clientele that they serve. We want that representation on your board. Um, even an example for me working at exploration place, it's a museum. Hey, it's, we've got all these board members and we're looking for a variety of expertise. If they have, you know, legal, if they can help us with human resources, but we're also looking for, um, people who might actually like coming to our museum and have maybe young kids or have grandkids. So it's really helpful if they're actually a user of the museum or a user of that nonprofit. So um, really there's, you don't have to have some, a bunch of special skills to find the right nonprofit to serve on. I think it's most that you have that connection with the uh, mission to find the right one. Okay. So the next thing I want to talk about um, is um, committing to the mission and strategic and annual planning. So, what the board is doing, so you'll know, they, they've all got a mission. They got a mission statement. It's listed on their, they got to file it with the IRS every year. It's on their 990. They've got a mission statement. And from time to time, organizations might put on their thinking caps and tweak it a little bit or change it. Or maybe they've like, whoa, we solved all the problems. Uh, we, we'll just, um, we can we can uh, close up shop. We've, we've solved it. I don't see that happening too much. But I mean, that would be the ultimate goal to put yourself on a business sometimes. Um, so you want to um, a lot, make sure that the organization's mission plans and activities are aligning with that mission. Um, and then ideally there is strategic and annual planning going on, which I kind of referenced a few minutes ago. You want to make, um, we sometimes call it a nonprofit's mission creep because like you're just trying to do good and something else comes along and that sounds good and that sounds good. And next thing you know, sometimes everyone is spread so thin and then maybe you're not really doing what your main mission is. So I think it's important to revisit that mission statement often, have a strategic plan for the next three years or the five years, have some specific goals and tactics, and then evaluate them as a board. I mean, you can, then you can kind of see that you've made progress. So strategic and annual planning is important um, and determining those. And then you can use your board meetings to measure your organization's progress in regard to things like budgeting, your CEO's annual performance review, board and committee work, and your programs process. Okay, now I'm going to talk a little bit more about the insurer resources umbrella. So one of the most important parts of a nonprofit's role is selecting that CEO, or there's a lot of nonprofits that might, there's no hired employee. Um, But so the board should be a partnership between the board and that chief executive. Um, Together, you also build who the board is. So 
one of, if you Google like board skills matrix, there are some ways where you can ask people what they have experience in and what they're comfortable, uh, comfortable planning with. And then that helps you figure out what, what, what knowledge do we have within our board that's already there? Like you may not know there's, you got Tony over here and all we know is, um, you know, he, he's a, he works in the aircraft industry, but we may not know that he has a real background in communications and marketing or something like that. So you want to find out what skills your board members have, identify gaps and use that to help recruit new board members. Because again, hopefully you're signing on for, it could be briefer than this, but hopefully you're saying, okay, I'm signing on for three years. And, and uh, then you're going to cycle on new people. And then ideally everything's staggered so that you have new board members, three or four at a time, let's say coming on each year. So you have some veterans there that have got a couple years under their belt and you've got new people coming in. Okay, so let's see. Um, the, <laughs> I think that pretty much covers. So again, you want to look at gaps and then we're also looking for different all means of diversity is only going to help make your organization stronger. So you want different backgrounds. So gender, race, those are great. Socioeconomic is great. And also just in skills and, and knowledge and careers. Okay, we're going to talk about ensuring resources. And so a couple of my fellow board source um, consultants, they like to do what they call the triple A board is somebody it's made up of ambassadors, askers, and advocates. So we hope that if you're signing, not everyone wants to be an asker. And an asker means someone that's actually going out there saying, hey, would you give us $1,000 to help this program? Or would you support us annually? So we do love the askers, someone who wants to go ask people for money. But we also need people who just want to be ambassadors for the mission. So if you're on that board, um, if you've heard the term before, like an elevator speech, you kind of want to have that elevator pitch. What you would say if you're riding up a floor or two to someone else to explain what your organization is and why you're a part of it. Um, one of the most effective, so I work as far as nonprofit staff, my areas are marketing that I supervise and development, which is fundraising. And one of the most valuable things to us as fundraisers, like we're happy to do the actual write the proposal, do the grant, make the ask, but it's very helpful and powerful to us to have a volunteer who might just want to come along to a meeting or talk about why they care about the organization. Because it's like, well, yeah, you're, I mean, this is your job, you're paid, but volunteers and volunteers on the board are extremely powerful when people say, you care enough about this that you're, you're investing your free time in it. But it is awesome because by the way, it's not as hard as you would think. People are out there and they're working along and everyone, people want to, they want to make a difference and they want to do something good. So, I mean, really getting them involved with a volunteer or you're asking them to donate money, people, if they have a connection to the work you're doing and they can see your passion and they can believe that you're using resources widely, people love to help you. So, you know, being a great ambassador, being an advocate for the mission, that's what we call a uh, very these are the three things we think are very helpful for resource development. Yes. Yes. Is there a ideal number of board members? Is there guidance that you have mm -hmm. at a minimum? Or that I think there might be a very basic minimum and that you kind of have. Oh, yes. Let me repeat the question. Yes, Sarah said, because everyone. Um, the question is, is there a minimum board size or is there an ideal board size? And you do see quite a variety. I think you do have to have a minimum uh, that you file on your 990 with the IRS, uh, board chair, you have a treasurer, secretary usually. You can have a pretty small board. You will see there are some very, very large boards. And I think in some ways, maybe they're, some of those is, is fairly ceremonial. Uh, I don't know how you can be effective with 48 board members, but some of them have it. But it might just be like, but cool, because we're hoping that your company will support us or they've got lots of connections. I do think, um, I think a lot you'll see the 10 to 12 up to about 24 board members. 
And, and the way a lot of boards work, it depends. Some do meet monthly. Um, some might be every other month or quarterly. And then usually if you're serving on a board, you may be asked to serve on a separate committee of that board. So for example, at Exploration Place, we have a nominating committee that's really about helping nominate each year new members to the board. We have a building committee uh, that advises on the structure. Uh, we have a, de a development committee is very common and that's um, helping specifically with fundraising. And then we may have special committees for say a special event fundraiser. Um, personnel committees are pretty common. Um, finance committee, investment committee, those are pretty standard. And then an organization's bylaws will usually say what their um, standing committees are and special ones. I do think if you're about to serve on any board, I recommend um, you can go on GuideStar or Charity Navigator or ProPublica. I recommend looking up the organization and opening up their tax documents that they file every year. I think it's illuminating. You can look on there and generally see how many comes, what money comes in kind of earned through services, what kind of level of donations they get, um, how much is spent, um, how much they might spend on programs and fundraising and uh, personnel salaries. Anyway, I just think it's nice to know a little bit more. Their, their mission statement will be there. Of course, you can just look at their, their website. But I think it's good to um, kind of, you, you kind of want to know um, what you're signing up for. I think it's also ideally um, you would meet with, say, the board chair, incoming board chair, or the chief executive, and they would kind of um, tell you where they are on their journey. And hopefully, you know, you want them to be candid. You know, it's not like a nonprofit has to be perfect, but you kind of want to know, like, oh, can we establish a relationship? Can we establish a trust? And can we, like, work together to advance this mission? Okay. And so also, let's go to the next. Let's go to the next. Okay. So the AAA board, uh, again, is just, um, you can support the organization's financial resource and growth through, I mean, helping bring people to events, involving them as volunteers. And another thing that we really appreciate board members doing sometimes is honestly just when someone has given, if a board member wants to follow up and reach out to someone and just thank them on behalf of the organization. So that's a good, I mean, good way. And people feel, um, Yes, I might thank them as a staff, but if they hear from that board member who they know is a community, as a volunteer, volunteering their time because they care so much and they get a thank you from them, that means a lot. So that's a big part of fundraising and philanthropy is we don't, we don't really want it to be super transactional. I mean, some people, you know, I'm giving you this for that. Ideally, you're developing more of a relationship with them. So you don't want to be like, yes, I got this here, but then they go away and never come back. Ideally, you're developing more of a relationship. And so stewardship is another word you'll hear a lot about. And that's kind of where the thanking comes in is just actually having a relationship, a partnership of saying, you care about this mission too. Um, let's, but, but, you know, it takes all kinds. And we're, ha we're happy if someone just wants to come to the gala and, um, buy an event ticket and have a fun time. We love that too. Okay, so let's talk about providing oversight. So some of the things that are um, that we wanna see a board do, we wanna see that there's a strong staff and board partnership where you know the board can be there as a sounding board. You can provide advice to that chief executive. I think the board, uh, the chief executive is gonna be maybe mired in some of that day-to-day -day management. And so those board meetings really are the time to step back, look at the strategic plan, think about the future, assess where the organization's going, and again, then evaluate and make sure you're keeping an eye on the finances and the wheels aren't coming off and we don't need to, uh, you know, or if you do, make some um, serious adjustments quickly. Okay, so that kind of takes us into... Um, the um, managing finances. So it is important that there's someone preparing accurate, um, timely, understandable financials. They typically will be a pretty standard format, but you just kind of want to see what's coming in, what's going out, and then you should be able to see a balance sheet um, and a statement of financial activities. And you should also be able to see 
the assets and the liabilities, and those should balance each other out. So you just want to make sure they are they are doing their financials. Um, some small organizations, very small, may not do an audit, but typically um, you're going to want to know that there's an audit done every year, and you're going to hopefully have a clean clean letter, uh, clean management letter that has findings on it or something that needs to be correct. So hopefully there's an audit happening. Uh, the nonprofit should be filing that's form 990 every year, which is what the rest of us can just Google and look up and see how they're doing and see what they're up to. Um, and there are just a number of things that an organization does need to do um, to stay, um, keep up that nonprofit status. So there's a, a report with the Secretary of State's office, um, make sure taxes are being withheld properly um, and that you're not kind of going to be non-compliant because you can end up in kind of a rough situation without that. I think... I think that, um, okay, I have a couple more things I want to go across, go over and then we'll talk about it. But I have a little document um, that we've used through board, sauce, board service about how to assess your board readiness. And so these are, I'm just going to read a couple of the statements that would kind of tell you, are you ready to serve on a board? And if you aren't on some of them, there's other ways you can be involved. You might, maybe you don't want to go to the meeting and take on this duty of looking over the finances. Maybe you just want to volunteer in the program. Maybe you can provide a pro, pro bono professional service because we love it if a lawyer wants to like look over something for us. And you may be able to serve on an advisory committee or a, uh, like a subcommittee of some sort. But you are probably ready for a board if there's, you're interested in advancing a cause that you feel passionate about. So I definitely think I can tell you that like I have been a really good volunteer board member. And there's a, like there's at least one time in my mind where I think I wasn't a very good board member. Like, I mean, I kind of showed up. And if they asked me to call somebody and thank someone, I did. But I think I just didn't like feel very connected or passionate about the mission. Like it was a good one. It was OK. I wasn't like against it, but I just didn't feel passionate about it. So I'm sure I was just like, I mean, I was just kind of like a seat filler, I think. So so ideally. Um, and so then I rotated off and I was like, yeah, this, let me find somebody good. Uh, you know, let me recommend some other people, but I realized I'm not really feeling connected. So if you can, if there's a cause you feel, um, connected to and passionate about, that is a good, strong signal that you're ready. Um, if you're interested in meeting people outside your usual professional and social circles, um, if you understand the roles and responsibilities that we just went through. So I feel like hopefully everyone in the room can hit check yes on that now. Um, you have enough autonomy in your schedule to accommodate their board and committee meetings. Um, and it, it just varies. So I think that's one of the things where if you're thinking about joining a board that you have that meeting with the, the board chair or the chief executive would be like, well, what are the expectations? And there might be a few that they might actually say, we actually expect a, a financial contribution from you each year in this amount, or that you either give it or that you get it donated. And so they, 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 you want to know that before you sign on and you want to make sure you're comfortable with that. So you want to know what their expectations are. Um, we want to know that you are patient and collegial and working with a team, that you can commit the time necessary. Um, I can imagine asking others to contribute financially to a cause I am passionate about. Um, if you can, that's awesome. I wouldn't say that's 100% a requirement because like I said, if you're willing to help with that stewardship or that thanking or just being an ambassador, if you go around with pride and passion for this organization you're in, that's, that helps the organization a ton just to get the kind of get their name out. And then, yeah, I kind of think that, I think that covers my overview. I'd love to answer any questions you might have, or if there's any experiences you've had um, that you might want to talk more about. Oh, and Sarah's got the microphone. We need a microphone. Okay. Yes, and I, as long as the microphone doesn't cut out, uh, this will ensure that we can get it on the, the yeah. live feed. Yeah. Oh. Hello. Hi there. So uh, can you talk to us about uh, the time commitment when you are interested and you are qualified? You know, I don't want to burn out. Yes, agree. <laughs> so... What is a 
good time commitment monthly? Can you give yeah. us like a monthly time commitment? I think, so let's say it's a board that meets um, monthly. Hopefully the board runs a fairly efficient meeting and it's just an hour, maybe an hour and a half. Um, so if you, you'd want to commit and mostly have that on your schedule, right? Anytime, you know, you can miss some here and there or you got life intervenes. So you'd want to commit to going to the meeting. Typically, um, the board chair will s- send out an agenda. Uh, sometimes, like we shoot, when I've done it, sometimes you shoot for the week in advance. Sometimes it's a day or two before. So I think you should set a little time before you go to the meeting to review those materials. Give a quick glance to the minutes from the month before. Look at the new financials. Hopefully, every time you're going to a board meeting, they've given you a new updated financial statement. So you should set aside 20 minutes to look through that so you're prepared. Go to the meeting. Be engaged in the meeting. That that could largely be your commitment. Most of the time, they may have asked you to serve on additional subcommittee. For example, over at Exploration Place, our investment committee only meets quarterly. So there may be another hour meeting quarterly with a little bit of review of materials separately, or there may be committees that meet every month. So just, I mean, I would say really a lot of times may just be a few hours a month. Now, if it's a small nonprofit and there is like no staff, I mean, you could find yourself doing like 20 hours a week or, or something. So it's, it, it, I think it is knowing your availability their expectations and kind of boundaries so you don't burn yourself out. Um, other ways board members might, you might be asked from time to time is, hey, could you, um, if you had someone you could make an introduction to, if it's a nonprofit with like a facility, a building, sometimes it's coming along and helping give tours and explaining what the, or, what the organization does. Uh, I would say ideally when you join a board, ideally there is some sort of onboarding or orientation process. Maybe it's the three of you as new board members, or maybe it's just you one-on-one, 30 or 40 minutes with um, the the board chair or the the executive director. So I think, um, but the 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 main business would be, and then sometimes there might be like a, they might call it an annual retreat or a, an annual meeting where maybe the meeting's two couple hours longer and you. Um, delve into the, the strategic plan or the next year's annual plan. So so typically, I think the best, what you would want to commit to is, am I joining any other committees? How often do we meet? And that you review the materials in advance uh, and then just come or special events or um, other program activities. Maybe you support them by coming out. Maybe sometimes you just um, attend an event um, that they do. So yeah, I think there could be a variety, but then, I mean, I don't know if some, any of you, do, I mean, sometimes people are like, well, this is my, this is my second part-time job. Um, they might get a little sucked in. So you, you do need to find out the expectations. Yes. To piggyback off that, is it typically then after typical business hours or are there some that meet during the, you know, yeah. the work day? So that, or? Yeah, that's a great question, too. You want to make sure your availability. So, for example, um, I'm a member of the Junior League of Wichita. We're an all a volunteer organization. I'm trying to think our typical annual budget was is around 500,000 total. We had a couple of part time employees. We always met in the evening, did our volunteer activities we met in the evening. Um, At Exploration Place, the board meets at 4 p.m. on the fourth Thursday of the month. So um, that and it all will probably depend. Probably the more, uh, the larger the organization is, the more, the kind of like the bigger budget, the more it's like a full on like business, right, that happens to have this nonprofit status. It's more likely to probably meet during the day and sometime. But I do know several that might meet over the lunch hour. Um, I had one where we, um, where we kind of, uh, we, if, if you were there, they would kind of just cater in some sandwiches. We met and we would, you know, toss a few bucks in to just kind of help off, offset it. And that's kind of how that worked. So, um, and these days, um, you know, a lot changed. We're recording this. A lot changed uh, in four years ago around this time. So a lot of organizations might be doing some more might be doing some Zoom meetings from time to time. They might be doing something hybrid. Um, So for at at Exploration Place all the time now, we have 
almost always there's an in-person meeting, but we also have several board members joining by Zoom. So if they had a commitment or they couldn't fit that travel time in across town, they might still be able to join in. So yeah, you definitely want to know when the meetings are because yeah, if you don't have the flexibility in your schedule that certain time, you're never gonna make it. <laughs> Any other questions? There is a nonprofit for everything. I mean, there's a bunny rescue group. There's, I mean, there's everything. They're right here and they probably need you if you like bunnies. Yes. See the bunnies. I met the the women from the bunny group and they're right. There's everything. Uh, my question is kind of related to what is a healthy interaction or level of interaction between the board and the staff members. Um, I'm currently part of an organization okay. that's very small. Yeah. Um, staff and board historically have had a lot of integration. Yeah. Um, but, you know, if you could speak to how healthy that is, you know, as a staff member, should I be, you know, participating as much as possible, getting annual minutes or, uh, you know, minutes of the meetings, things like that? Or is that something that I should just stay out? Yeah, that's a good, that could be like a, so the, you guys all heard the question about what's a healthy balance and that can look a little different, but I do think a lot of times um, from the staff perspective, or maybe it's the CEO, but we typically want to not have board members going directly to a bunch of different staff members or staff members going directly to the board. Not that you might not work together on, for example, um, fundraising is one of my areas. So we have a resource, we have a development committee that meets on Zoom every other week. I'm there with our board members and so is our CEO. So it's more like filtered um, and hopefully it's maybe sort of a, um, a couple key staff like that might oversee, but hopefully there's not like board members going directly to sort of a frontline employee asking them this or that, or that the employees aren't going directly there. Typically, hiring your CEO, and that the CEO is in charge of managing operations day to day, and you want them reporting to you how it's going, but. The thing is you want them on the management because you are there for the financial oversight and the big picture and the future and like setting the course for the overall direction um, and maybe just checkpointing and how we're doing at progress. So you don't actually want, or we don't want you in the day-to-day -day because then if everyone's in the day-to-day, -day, then no one's like looking out at the future or strategic. So that's why I would say you might work with them, but hopefully it's a little bit um, narrowed. for all this yeah the board being responsible for future direction and that's kind of the the kind of filter through them yeah even though i think you might say as a board member if you are we have an education committee right and so we have a key staff person for we have a staff person at exploration place that fits with every committee and so our director of education like works with them we do an agenda we do a meeting and so it's very appropriate for the two of them as that committee chair and that staff member to work together um, and I work with like, you know, our development committee. So it's hopefully in defined roles okay. that way. Yeah. So that's what I was, that's what I was, I work for a, a federal nonprofit and I work for a federal nonprofit and the only time that I'm at the full board meeting and mostly I go to the executive meetings is when I've got something on the agenda. And if I've got an item on the agenda, then it's my response questions about it but ours is almost it, there's the ceo and then there's the they call them like the upper staff mm -hmm. you know? and then it trickles down to the middle staff and then there's workers. but i do love to see it like if you're on a board or encourage the ceo i do love to see it like you know maybe this month we wanted to invite someone in from this area to share a success story or for the board to kind of applaud them for some work they did. So I do think it's nice for the board to recognize and for staff to come in time to time so the board can have a better understanding of the day-to-day -day work and not just be like, I'm looking at the financial statement. So I think that is great. But ideally, you don't have some board member going to Susie to ask her to do something and, and all that. But we are there. I mean, ultimately, we work for the board by by definition. So we're, the, we're available. <laughs> but... 
they they wouldn't. I mean, it would always filter through. Yeah. Yeah. So um, you mentioned that your experience on serving a board where uh -huh. you felt like a filler. Yeah. Wouldn't. What advice would you have for someone who does feel like a filler? Um, they're not interested. Yeah. Should they just terminate their board membership or should they I mean, try it's to hard find... because sometimes you feel like, well, I signed up for it. Yeah. Signed up for this team all season, you are going to finish. Uh, so maybe there's that. Maybe don't renew. I always think like, you know, whether you're ending your term early or not, it's nice if you can like, um, like maybe you can help think of some new people to recommend and like maybe you're like sweet if you could replace yourself with someone better than you I mean how awesome is that you know like if you can feel like well I can ride off into the sunset knowing that I've asked Sarah to start getting involved and maybe they'll get her on the board so yeah I mean and in that case I realized like I wasn't I was still like they said can you call these people and thank them okay I, I mean I did the things but I definitely just I did kind of I I think I filled out my whole term or I might fill out a year, but like things happen all the time. Someone gets a new job and they move. And so it's like the, the nonprofit, if it's going to break because you like them, we got, we got big problems. Hopefully it doesn't break because one board member has like a, something's gone on with their family or they've got a life change. It should, you should be okay. Um, but I do think when w sometimes boards, they might be looking at it just thinking, well, we need, we need this giant company A with all the employees who just need representation on our board. And maybe you do, and maybe it's an industry that relates to what you're doing. But I just always feel like you get the most, like maybe we want that too, but can it be someone who, who also has a con some sort of connection or passion to the mission or might use our services? Or for me, it's like, well, yeah, we could use some more advice, um, in IT, but like, I also be like, it'd be awesome if that person had little kids and actually would come to Exploration Place in, in that way. So it's just always better if the person has a connection versus if they have no real interest in it, but maybe they have some professional services, they can still be valuable on the board. But I just think if you have a passion for something, you are going to be valuable to a nonprofit out there. And, you know, and sometimes it may take a little bit, like they may want to get to know you a little bit. They want to see you volunteering a little bit, or maybe you're helping out with a committee um, so that they kind of feel like they've gotten to know you. But yeah, I mean, I did, just, I think I, I finished, but was like, yeah, I don't think I'm going to renew, but maybe, um, you know, I think, I think it'd be great if we found somebody else from, um, I could like, pass on. I don't know if I, I didn't like specifically like recruit somebody new for me, but I just realized, yeah, that I wasn't like doing as much as I could or feeling as like much of a contributor. So, and you, we all have very limited time. So you might as well um, do it somewhere where that you've got some passion. Waiting for green. <laughs> Waiting for the green light. But we're good. We're good. Uh, so um, to relate to what you just mentioned about they want to get some time to get to know you and like see how invested you are. My question is, how long does it take to like join a board? Like to like, I show up and yeah. like, what's that process like from your experience? Like, is so it? It will. Yeah, it it will definitely like if it's like a giant institution of sort it might be like well maybe i could get you might join a committee and serve on it and just kind of express your interest some other people might be like uh yeah come on come on down tomorrow we got a meeting on we got a meeting wednesday night um a lot of times though boards maybe have a they have a, maybe according to their fiscal year that's kind of when they would start their new board year so it might be um they may not be even though they might technically have an opening let's say someone has moved they may not actually really try to fill that position for say six months. If like it's a July one fiscal year. So it really just depends. I think um, definitely if you, if you, you do have some sort of, if it's a, if you have some marketing expertise or some communications expertise, some human resources, any, 
there's any sort of expertise you have that, that might accelerate things a little bit. Um, but I, I don't know if this is, I, I, someone told me before, I hope this is accurate, that we have like 2,000 nonprofits in the county or something like that, which sounds crazy, but maybe not crazy. So they, there are a lot out there and there are a lot, um, any scale that you might want to find. Um, so if you, I mean, and if you're like, I don't just want to advise and think and scrutinize, I want to roll up my sleeves. Oh, you will have no problem. They, I mean, people will love for you to be kind of, taking it in and running the nonprofit halfway through your day. Um, helping off all the programs. So really, it's like the um, not a, not, not a lot of limit. There's always board. They always probably, each of them probably want eight or 10 people on them. And they've got to have it in order to have your, keep that nonprofit status and to be advancing their mission. They've got to have this board that's kind of saying we're committing to kind of, um, keep an eye on things and make sure things are above board and ethical and that we have a mission that we're working toward. So um, if you want to be on a board volunteer, yeah, that's the biggest, that's probably, Good tip. Yes. that's probably the biggest piece is just go volunteer. And the more you volunteer, the more you'll get to know the, the board members and the more they'll get to know you. But I mean, it's, I'm, I'm a big, yes, big totally. believer in the volunteer. Any other questions? Thank you all for coming out. Oh yeah. Keep, no, keep asking. We're good. One more time. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Yes. Okay. So I should tell you, so we are, um, we've sometimes done this thing called board source university where we've gotten together and done like modules on several different things. We do roles and responsibilities. We do one on fundraising cause that's a whole deal. Um, we've partnered in the last couple of years. Uh, we've partnered with the W which is the young professionals group of the chamber, um, the nonprofit chamber of service. We've done some things with that. Although I think that organization has recently disbanded. Um, so we, from time to time, um, host some events at Junior League of Wichita um, and try to do just some connecting. Um, there are some different organizations from time to time that if you just kind of keep your eye out, might try to do kind of like a board matching event from time to time. There might be times where you just say your interest or every now and then the chamber or the nonprofit chamber would put together kind of a mixer event where you're just trying to be like, hey, we're boards and then, hey, we're people and try to find ways to Kind of like speed date and match you so that's an option shameless plug yes Ooh. i'm with w and okay. so we're doing something in april that's like a perfect right so you want to help because that's a great audience of people i mean don't you i mean i get to work at a nonprofit every day so i just can like pat myself on the back and feel, but sometimes when you're just making those widgets out there and selling the widgets it's awesome but you want to find a way to give back and so those of us in the nonprofit business sector, we're just like, come on over. We would love your skills and services or you to give back your time because we all want to feel like we're making a difference and making the world a little bit better in everything we do. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, the chamber is a very big board. I'm not yeah. saying I'm yeah. on that, but just in the realm of board yeah. service, how do you effectively communicate in a one hour meeting? And then like, let's say there is like, for instance, you mentioned the nonprofit chamber, they disbanded and they had to make a hard decision yeah. as a board. Um, how do you do that and say like, oh, uh, this doesn't seem right internally, or maybe this doesn't seem ethical. Yeah. Is that kind of Okay. That's good. Hey, lots of times there might be a policy. There might actually be a whistleblower policy that exists. Um, I, I think to keep those meetings efficient and maybe if the board doesn't meet very often, maybe it is a two hour meeting. But ideally, that's why you have the different committees that the board is delegating this responsibility to the committee. And so some work happens in the committee. So the building committee is getting all these bids. We're trying to figure out the best way to drudge the pond and how much it's going to cost. They synthesize. They talk it over in their meetings. And maybe that's an hour or two or a smaller group. But then they come and they bring their, bring their recommendation to the board and kind of distill it down. So ideally, that's how you can kind of keep those meetings um, functioning at a higher level. I think it's very helpful 
if the, the sort of like the chief executive, the executive director is giving like updates on the organization or overall um, updates. But again, you're right. You do need to kind of, you know, um, make, you, sometimes they need to call special meetings. And I'm sure that and the meetings go on a little bit longer than the typical meeting if there are um, some struggles or some things that are uncovered that are kind of concerning that you kind of feel like, whoa, we better better get a handle on that. So, um, yeah, like, but I think you do want to, ideally, there's there's an agenda, there's updated financials, there's a assist, you know what I mean? And then there should be a space for new business or other business. And I, and I do think that is your, that is your role or that's your opportunity as a board. If you do want to raise something, you're all there gathered at the board table. And ideally, you kind of have established some norms of operation of how you're going to um, be focused when you're there in the room and you're going to be respectful, but that is your opportunity at the board mem meeting is to say, if you, if you've got to raise something that everyone needs to hash out, I should also say that a lot of boards also have an executive committee that's maybe made up of uh, president, secretary, treasurer, maybe the chair elect, maybe a couple of at large members. And that that body might be delegated some responsibility to keep some business going, but maybe you didn't want to wait, wait till the next board meeting or maybe Maybe there's a dicey personnel matter or, you know, maybe there's a lawsuit or someone's been injured, you know, like some of those things. Um, there might be an executive committee that meets um, as well. That's fairly obvious, especially if the board is 24 or 48. There's usually an executive committee that's been selected that um, can maybe delve into some of those more sensitive things because it, it might not be. You might not always have the most frank conversations in a room of. 18 or 20 people, or maybe it is if you kind of developed a relationship and you work together, hopefully you can have those dialogues. But I, I think sometimes if it's super big, then it almost becomes hard to have those like difficult conversations or those real productive conversations, because it almost seems like it's maybe too widespread, too. Yeah, yeah, sure. You touched on this in the beginning when you mentioned insurance, but is there a place on the is there a place on the form nine ninety or you know if, as a yeah. board member, I think your most companies or uh, nonprofits have like an insurance to protect yes. liability, correct? Yes. Is there a place to assure that or, you know insure when you're doing research on these nonprofits? No, I'm also on a separate board right now that's like a professional organization. And it was one of the questions that one of our board members said, she's like, well, I just want to know, like, are we technically, do we, are we insured here? Or do we have it? And we were able to go back and our parent organization sponsored it for all of us. Like it's a national organization with local chapters. I don't know. One thing I'm always looking for on the 990 of like a foundation, they can check a box if they're, uh, if you can send them an unsolicited request. So that's a fun one. So really just get up close and personal with the 990 related to whatever your interest is. And, and if you want to see how if executive is paid, if you want to see, is this foundation, will they accept a, like a grant, like requests? I'm all like, oh yes, they'll accept it on some of them, but some of them don't check it. And so you're like, oh, I can't just ask you for funding out of the blue. So I don't know off the top of my head, because it's a pretty long and there's some additional schedules. I don't know if that's on there, um, but typically that's something, it's not very expensive and that you'll want, maybe you just want to ask about. Outside of board meeting, how much time do most board members put into promoting the organization and doing their duties? Yeah, well, I mean, it varies widely, but I hope they're just always ready for that elevator ride to just be like, oh, yeah, I'm involved with this. Or, hey, we're having this little mixer somewhere else. You want to come out or just be ready to answer any questions. Um, so some. Um, some might just be a walking billboard. Some maybe don't put too much into it. But. We'd hope that you would be um, kind of like a great cheerleader for the organization if you ever hear anybody asking or question, you know, commenting. And hopefully you can um, maybe if there is something that maybe has like a negative perception, maybe you'd be like, well, that's actually that's not been my experience at all. I'm serving on the board. I can tell you we really care a lot about it or 
yeah, it's not perfect, but we're, we're working on it. So just, it would vary, I guess, but hopefully anytime you're in that elevator, you're ready to you know the mission, I guess would be like, if you could read the materials, go to the meeting and actually know the mission. I mean, that is great. I mean, I feel like we got to know those things. Yeah. One thing to say in response to your question about the insurance. And so if you are on a board and that's a concern of yours, um, I would also recommend that you ensure that those premiums are paid, oh, that you that you see those on the financial statements and things like that, because it could be, well, yeah, well, we have insurance, you know, now. Well, we forgot to renew it. Yeah. 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 And so that's important. Okay, well, lots of fun. Um, I hope you're either kind of inspired to go out there and find the next nonprofit where you want to make a difference or uh, maybe got a few nuggets for volunteer opportunities you might be involved with. But um, I hope, I think that's one thing that can make us all a little more optimistic or hopeful about the world is if you can find a way to work with other people on something outside of your work and outside of your family that you care about, I think um, you always get as much out of it as you put into it. So the more you put into it, you got to put something into it to get something out of it. And the one time I was kind of a dud, I was like not really putting enough into it. So. Well, that's yeah. wonderful. Thank you so much to Laura Roddy from the junior league and exploration place. Um, and thanks to all of you for showing up and putting in the work. Um, so uh, if you could, on your way out, fill out an evaluation for us, let us know what you thought. Let us know if there's any other programs like this or others that you would be interested in hearing about. We would absolutely appreciate your feedback. Um, and have a great rest of your evening.